Welcome to this month's BA webinar. Um, we're broadcasting on Zoom with live stream to YouTube. And as always, the recording will be available to watch on our YouTube channel shortly afterwards. Um, you can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A on Zoom or the comments in YouTube, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to welcome back Howard Banish for his second BA webinar. This time, he'll be giving us a talk on the history of silvering telescope mirrors. Howard's been enthralled with astronomy since he was 11 years old when he for, saw Saturn through a tiny, quite wobbly telescope. He built his first telescope at age 14 and soon started sketching his observations. That's been a consistent theme ever since. He eventually began writing about his observations, culminating in becoming a contributing editor to Sky and Telescope magazine in 2016. He's currently up working on upgrading his 28 inch telescope to a 30 inch telescope. So that's really, yeah, uh, 28 inch kind of boggles my mind. 30 inches really kind of, wow. That's, that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have, we'll have, an, have you back for another webinar on that sometime. Okay. <laughs> and Howard lives in Scapoose? Scapoose. Oregon, USA, with his wife, Judy, and their dog, Falco. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for coming to give us this talk, Howard, and over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be back. And the, uh, oh, let's see. So we'll just get right into it. I'm gonna share my screen with my presentation, and we'll get going right into it. There we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yeah, that's looking good. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is um, what I think is a very interesting subject, you know, silvering telescope mirrors. It's something that we take for granted these days, but has, has quite an interesting history um, and a fairly short one as well. Um, and as probably most of you know, you know, before silver was used on glass telescope mirrors, there was speculum metal. And here's a picture of Lord Ross's, one of his 72 inch speculum mirrors. Um, there, the thing about speculum was that this is how reflecting telescopes began from um, Isaac Newton's first reflector. Um, all the way up through 1868 with the Great Melbourne Telescope in Australia. The, the, these, these types of mirrors were the de facto technology for having a reflecting telescope. They, they were very heavy, extremely difficult to grind, polish, and figure, and they tarnished quickly as well. There was uh, really no two ways about it um, for, for quite a long time. And, and even at their best, when they were freshly polished, they were 60 to 66% reflective, depending on the mixture of, of the materials that were used of the metals that were alloyed together. And, and that was about, that's about the same as platinum. So when you consider you know, a, um, how reflective a modern aluminum or, or a silver coating is, it's really, quite a dull reflecting surface, but that's, that's what we have. Okay, then silver and glass mirrors were developed and two, two people are largely responsible. Carl August von Steinhill and Leo Foucault. And it's, yes, that's the Foucault that you're thinking of, the, the one of the, uh, the pendulum and the, and the Foucault knife edge test. He's the guy, one of the main characters in developing a practical optical quality silver coating for a glass mirror. Now that was a huge step uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that when you had a speculum mirror in the telescope, you needed two mirrors, one in the telescope for observing and the other one you were repolishing to remove the tarnish because the, the tarnish, tarnishing process went fairly quickly. And so you needed two to have an active telescope to observe with at any given time. Um, 
So with a silver on glass mirror, you only needed one mirror now. Plus, after the silver has tarnished, it only takes a day to remove that old coating and put on a brand new one, and there's no refiguring of the mirror. Plus, I guess the third, third big reason is that silver is, can be up to 97% reflective when it's, when it's brand new. So compare that to, reflect, to the reflectivity of, of uh, speculum mirrors. I mean, that's a huge advance. Now this great old photo is of the, the very first large silver and glass mirror telescope. Um, at the Marseille Observatory in southern France. It was the, it's an F5.8. It's called the Foucault 80 centimeter telescope because he was the one who made the mirror and did the coating. It's not quite 80 centimeters. It's, as you can see there, it's the 78.8, but 80 sounds better, I suppose. Nice round number. Um, and this is the very first large mirror that not only was silvered, but also was figured using Foucault's knife edge testing. So this was not only the most reflective large telescope of its time, it was the most accurately figured. So it was really quite an advance. Now this, this photo here is you know, obviously in black and white. This is from back in the day. And this is a more modern photo of it. And you can see it's made almost entirely out of wood. It looks like something some amateur could, could build in his, in his back garden and, and, and use happily. Although, you know, almost 80 centimeter, or this is really quite a large instrument. So a lot of discoveries were made with this. And, and one that I think is the most interesting that Edward Stefan discovered the same as Quintet of Galaxies in 1876, Stefan's Quintet. Um, I bet you it was quite a sight in, in a telescope that size. All right, so, so Foucault has now developed the, the, the silvering process, and it is, is it a messy, nauseous, noxious process. You have to mix the, the chemicals just so. You have to mix them freshly. You can't store them because some of them can, can explode if they're left alone. Um, and these two images here on the left side of the screen are from a film called Telescope Makers from uh, 1960. Shows some UK um, telescope makers. And this is the, the silvering process. And you can see it on the top left photo that the, the mirror has, it looks like a, a paper dam wrapped around the edge. And the silvering chemicals have been poured into that and have immersed the entire surface of the mirror. And he's sloshing it back and forth gently. Um, and this is a pretty good sized mirror. So it's, you know, this is a, um, a physical activity that he's doing there. Um, and then the, the bottom image shows that after the silvering process is complete and he's rinsed the mirror, the streaks on the mirror are just uh, residual water dripping off. But as you can see, he has a, a brilliant silver coating. Um, what isn't shown here and what's not shown in the, in the film is the cleaning process. And the cleaning process for the silvering, um, for silvering to come up with a quality coating has to be done perfectly. There can't be any contaminants on the glass whatsoever. Otherwise, the, the silver chemicals will not stick to the glass. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more as we go along and, um, and then, um, let's see, I'm just making an adjustment here. Okay, and, and that'll make more sense. All right, so now just because Foucault had developed the silver on glass technology, doesn't mean that it was adopted universally. Now this is the Great Melbourne Telescope. It was built six years after the 80 centimeter Foucault telescope was. Um, okay, six years, that, that's a pretty long time, but it was deemed still a little uncertain on whether 
silver on glass was really the way to go for a, a number of reasons, but I think it's just, you know, progress goes in fits and starts. You know, this was a, 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 a British telescope, Foucault was French, meh, I probably had something to do with it, I don't know. Anyway, so this, this beautiful looking instrument actually had several first as well as several lasts. Um, this, this is the, the first large telescope built for visual observation with the Cassegrainian focus. You can see down at the bottom where the eyepiece is. Um, it's on a equatorial mount with a counterweight and it had a, a very finely made drive system. It was at first driven by a counterweight. You can see that the gentleman standing there with the bowler hat, and you can see the weights right that he has his hands on, which would, I guess, make the, the telescope track a little too fast. But anyway, um, it's a beautiful instrument, but it's this was the last large specular mirror telescope that was made. Um, and it was the last design primarily for visual observation. So this was the end of two eras, actually. Um, it was not particularly successful as a uh, as a research telescope, as well. It was just it was it quickly became a dinosaur as astrophotography became more and more capable. So it, it's a shame. A lot of effort and a lot of work went into this beautiful looking instrument. Too bad it didn't have a glass and silver mirror. Okay, so. Now let's come, come into the more modern era or the beginning of the modern era for large telescopes. Um, I love this photo and I'll tell you why. Um, this, this photo is of the 60 inch mirror for the Mount Wilson, uh, Mount Wilson that was built prior to the 100 inch. Mount Wilson is in Southern California up in the mountains. Um, this was this telescope was designed from the beginning to have a glass on silver, a silver on glass mirror, pardon me. And what we see here is the mirror within its cell, but also on a, a jig that is designed for the silvering process. That, that handle sticking off to the upper right kind of looks like it's for a frying pan. Well, that's used to adjust the angle of the mirror during the silvering process, which you need to have be able to easily move the, the mirror from vertical to nearly horizontal throughout the process. And so this is a beautifully designed jig. You can see it's on rails where it just rolled right back from the bottom end of the telescope. And they could resilver it, put it back in the mirror in an afternoon, put it back in the telescope in an afternoon and be back observing that same evening. So this is you know, much lighter than speculum. Um, it's about 96% reflective, and it, it doesn't tarnish as fast as speculum. Doesn't affect the optical figure of the glass when you resurface. And this, this is the very, this photo shows the very first silvering of the mirror in 1908. And I just, I just think it's a wonderful image. Now the largest silver and glass telescope mirror ever was the 100 inch, also at Mount Wilson. Um, this, this image shows workmen cleaning the, the glass for its very first aluminum coating. This is at, at this is in 1936, I, I, I think is the, is the date. And they had been using silver on glass, but now aluminum, putting on aluminum coating and a vacuum chainer chamber had been developed you know, at Mount Wilson by a Dr. Strong. And this was getting the, the mirror ready for its first alumin, aluminum coating. And just look at how thick that disc of glass is. Goodness, that must weigh as much as a, as a house. But anyway, it, uh, it, it's been a, a marvelous, uh, mirror in the, in the telescope for many, many years. So here's some modern 
photos of these two telescopes. Um, they're the, the 60 inch and the 100 inch can both be rented by amateurs for an evening. Usually groups of 10 or 15 all get together to, to make the cost per person affordable. Um, so typically people think of the 60 inch as the first modern reflecting telescope. Um, the 60 inch had a silver coating for 27 years and the 100 inch had a silver coating for 18 years. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. John Strong, the developer of the aluminizing process, aluminized both these mirrors in 1930. I think it's 36. That might be a typo on my part, but just around in there. So aluminum was a is, a, is an advanced over silver in the sense that it's more durable. Aluminum doesn't tarnish per se. Um, silver tarnishes at a fairly predictable rate, you know, given the, the conditions that the telescope is used in and will need to be replaced every one to two years. Aluminum can last much, much longer, uh, again, depending on the conditions. And so it's more economical. You have to, there's less, risk of taking the mirror in and out of the telescope. I mean, accidents can happen. So, so aluminization became the de facto and remains the de facto technology for putting a shiny coating on top of a uh, glass telescope mirror. Okay, so today, um, spray silvering is, has, has become the, the way to actually put a silver coating on the telescope mirror for, for amateurs. For, for telescope mirrors above 10 inches and larger, let's put it that way. Um, for, if you wanna do it yourself, of course, you, know, you can always send off your, your mirror to be aluminized and have it done once and then forget about it for 20 years. Um, aluminum coatings can be anywhere between 88, 89% reflective for bare aluminum, up to about 96% for a top notch enhanced coating. Um, some, some of these last longer than others. A, a bare aluminum coating actually is, is rather delicate and, and doesn't last that long, especially in a damp climate. So it's not much of an advantage over, over uh, silver in, in that type of climate, which is what I live in. Um, and it's not nearly as reflective. So anyway, so the, the spray silver process is, is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of immersing the, the, the optical surface of the mirror, with the silvery chemicals. The chemicals are mixed in, in two separate bottles that are then hooked up to two separate hoses with two separate sprayers that are then side by side. You can just barely see how that looks in the, in the uh, photo in the, in the center, upper center. And I'll, I'll have more, more detailed photos of that coming up. And so the chemicals are actually mixed in the spray as they come out of the nozzle and hit the glass. So, I mean, it, it kind of looks like it's being spray painted, but it's a, still a chemical reaction. The silver does not build up and change the optical surface of the glass at all. Um, and this, we, this has been shown interferomically. So it is, it is a, a process that is is fairly quick and, and surprisingly easy. It produces a precision, highly reflective coating that one can do in their garage in an afternoon. So I'll, I'll get into these, in, into these steps in more, more detail as, as we're coming up here. But it's, I think it's important to note that, you know, here again, cleaning the glass, you can see the upper left black and white image, Cleaning the glass is the most important part of the whole process. 
And that's been true from the very beginning with Foucault and Steinhill. It's just without perfectly clean glass, the silver chemicals will not adhere to the glass surface evenly, and you'll get splotches where it won't adhere at all, and areas where where it will flake off much too soon. So the cleaning process is, is absolutely crucial to the success of a, of a silver or an aluminum coating. It's the same thing goes. Um, you know, before any type of coating is put on the glass mirror, that glass has to be clean to the molecular level. So fortunately, that, that's not as difficult as it might sound, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that here in just a little bit. But perfectly clean is not an exaggeration. There's no hyperbole there at all. Now, the, the, the spray silver process that is used now were developed at, at Tinsley Labs in the University of Arizona in the 1970s. And they refined the process to the point where pretty much anyone walking off the street can do it if they can read and follow instructions. Like I said, it's not a difficult process. It can be done in an afternoon successfully by someone who's, who's working carefully. Um, I'm not a, I have no training in chemistry. Um, when I took chemistry in school, I was not the best student. Um, this is just a matter of paying attention to the process. It, it's, it, it's a surprisingly accessible process for, for pretty much anyone. And so th this page is from a Applied Optics article from 1977, going through the process as they had develop, developed it up to that point. And this is much the same process as what is used and, and sold by a company called Angel Gilding. And, and that's where I've purchased my equipment and chemicals from. And I think is the only available company to get the, the chemicals from currently, unless you go out and source each one individually, which is certainly possible. Okay, so here's a picture of those dual sprayers that I mentioned. Um, you can see down at the bottom, there's, there's two sprayers that are connected side by side. And the, the silver solution, which has the actual silver in, in it, and the silver reducer, which helps, helps that silver precipitate out in the, in the spray, get mixed in the spray as they come out. And these are just pump bottles. You just pump them up to, to, to a certain pressure, like maybe 15, 20 pumps, and you're ready to go. Um, Angel Gilding sells this kit for about $380. Um, is it available in the UK? I don't know. Um, but you can see their website there at the bottom. Um, it's uh, it's they have several videos on there that show the process. They're they're not marketing this for telescope mirrors. They're they're marketing this for for artists silvering artistic looking mirrors or silvering unusual objects like bottles and and this and that. So um, they have um, a lot of background in spray silvering but not necessarily for using it on telescope mirrors. Because, okay, consider when you, when you look in the mirror, any mirror at home or anywhere out in the world, you're looking at the, at the silver, because it is real silver back there. It's behind the glass where it's protected. And the backside of the silver is painted with a special black paint. So it can't tarnish. The air, air can't get to it. And they, they last typically for forever. And that's the sort of thing that, a, that Angel Gilding, those are the types of customers that, that they're, they've made their process for. So we've taken their, their process and really without adapting it at all, have used it successfully for telescope mirrors. All right, now here's a, a, a screenshot of a 30 inch mirror made by Mel Bartels, a uh, well-known telescope maker and uh, observer who lives, also lives here in Oregon. 
Um, this is quite a remarkable mirror. It's a 30 inch F2.7. Um, it's, uh, it's a very thin meniscus mirror, which means it's constant thickness from the edge through the center. Um, he basically, basically he, he bought a, uh, a glass tabletop, 30 inches of diameter. He had it slumped in a kiln to the proper curve that he, he wanted, F2.7. Then he ground and polished and figured it. And it's absolutely magnificent what, what he's achieved here. And, and this 30 inch mirror weighs 38 pounds. So that would be what, 15 kilos? Um, I mean, it's remarkable. I mean, a, 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 a full thickness 30 inch mirror would weigh much more than that. So, and you can see how, how bright and, and, and shiny the, the coating is on, on this one. Now, there is an alternative way, the more do it yourself way. Um, you can use hand sprayers. This is a picture of my friend Peter um, spray silvering a 20 inch mirror. He has the chemicals and just two hand spray bottles. The same process is happening. The chemicals combine in the spray and he gets excellent results doing this. I think he must also have the strongest grip um, in the world because spraying with pumping the, the, the spray handles on these bottles throughout the process would be would be more than I could do. It would just be too tiring for my hands. I wouldn't be able to keep it up, but it'd be excellent exercise <laughs> for one's grip. That's for sure. Um, actually, and interestingly about this mirror that he's silvering here, this was, or this is a um, uh, relatively historical mirror in, in Canadian history. It was, it's like 120 years old. And Peter is part of a team that is restoring the, um, the optics and putting a, a silver coating on here as, the, as it originally had to be put into a display in a museum. Uh, it's really a cool project. Okay. So here's a picture of Mel Bartels with his newly silvered 30 inch mirror. Um, typical reflectivity measurements for fresh silver are, you can see there. So basically about 97% across the visual spectrum. <clears throat> and there is a quality of the telescopic views with a, especially a freshly silvered mirror that is a little bit of a leap beyond even a freshly aluminized enhanced coated mirror. The, the intensity of star colors is so much more apparent. The contrast is significantly higher right up to, high, to, to bright objects. And in bright nebula like M42, the colors there are more obvious as well. It's really quite remarkable to do a comparison, which, which Mel and I have done. Um, I had a freshly, fresh silver coating on my 20 inch mirror and he had a fresh enhanced aluminum coating on his 25 inch mirror from, oh gosh, what? Three years ago now. And uh, we did uh, several comparisons and there, there was no doubt that the, the color intensity and the contrast was better with the silver coating. Now, another, uh, which I haven't mentioned, I, I don't know why, but I'll mention it now. Um, the cost of spray silvering a mirror this size, you know, for, I already mentioned the cost of the full kit, about 380 US dollars. That, that, could, that could coat this 30 inch mirror a dozen times. Um, to get that same mirror with an enhanced coating on it, aluminum coating, would cost over $2,000 if you can find a, 
a company that illuminizes that would even take this mirror. So it's a, uh, it's a daunting project financially when you get to th this size. Now in smaller sizes, I think I mentioned earlier, 10 inches is about the smallest size you'd probably wanna consider doing just because of the cost. Um, buying the kit is $380. You can get a really quality aluminum coating on a 10 inch mirror and smaller for much less than that. So it, it kind of, at that point, it kind of depends on how much you want to do yourself. But the larger the mirror goes, the more economic sense this makes. Plus it's an absolute delight to, to do the process and end up with a beautiful result like Mel has. And um, he's had some really remarkable observations with this telescope. He lives on the other side of the mountains from me, where, which is a high desert environment where it's dry, he's up in elevation, he doesn't have as many clouds, he doesn't get hardly any rain. So he lives kind of in like the perfect spot if you wanna look at the night sky. And listening to, to him describe what he sees and see his sketches it has been really a delight. And if you do invite me back about why I'm in the midst of transforming my 28 inch telescope to a 30 inch telescope, Mel is the reason. So, but that's the story for another day. Okay, now this funny looking picture is a close up of my 28 inch mirror. No, it's not radioactive. That's the center dot. And that's just the, um, that just helps get the, uh, the center dot centered in my Cheshire eyepiece. Um, but anyway, this is tw 23, after 23 months, spray silver coating, and I measured the reflectivity at this point. In, and in the red, it was 95% reflective, it was 88% in the green, and 78% in the blue. Um, which really is, is pretty remarkable because I, I observed a lot with this coating during those 23 months. And like I mentioned, I, I live in a, a very wet, humid climate. And, I, and so this, this mirror is subjected to probably the worst possible conditions. And still I got 23 good months. It, it could probably have gone for another six months just as easily before I would notice any type of image degradation. You can see the you know, dust on the surface there and you can see some spots where tarnishing is beginning. Um, but you know, still, those are, those are pretty good numbers for a 23-month uh, silver coating of any type. So as I mentioned, um, you know, silvering telescope mirrors has only been a thing for a short time, 164 years. Um, and yet, 164 years, well, that's quite a bit of time, especially you know, considering the rapid pace of technological development. But no one has still come up with a way to have to, to do an easy to apply, a long lasting and completely transparent optical quality overcoat that completely starts tarnishing and definitely protects the silver from atmospheric contaminants. Some of these little spots are like from pollen, um, just stuff floating in the air. Now, and also to be inexpensive. Um, so, and this is not something that, you know, just amateurs have been looking at I and mean, professionals have been, you know, working on this as well, because, you know, if you can get the, the reflect, reflective power of fresh silver and keep a telescope mirror at that reflectivity indefinitely, that, that gives it a real boost over aluminum technology now. But, no, no one's been able to crack that nut yet. Maybe it's something that can't be done, at least with current technology, but you know, stay tuned, you never know. It, it could very well be there's something out there made for some completely different process that would be just the thing for this. Time will tell. 
Okay, now, if, if this is something that you want to know more about, um, you know, I've put together complete instructions, uh, complete with short videos, and the videos are of Mel Bartell silvering his 30-inch mirror that we've just seen. Here's, here's the website. Um, it's, and even if you're not interested in doing it yourself, it's an interesting process to, to see, you know, writing it out, because most, most of what is on this website is, is a written description. And you're know, writing about anything uh, makes it look and, and, and come across as more complex than it actually is. But when you watch it, you can see how straightforward it is. And so it's, if you have a sizable telescope and, and this is something that catches your interest, hey, here's, here's where all the information is put together by myself and several other people that I know who have been into spray silvering for the last, oh gosh, what, five years now? Um, it, uh, it's, it's become a, 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 a technology readily accessible to amateurs now. And uh, that's why I enjoy any chance I, I can get to, to talk about this and, and, and spread awareness that this is still a thing. Okay, so now I have some short videos I'm going to try to, to share. Um, I tried, did a little practice session with Andy before this presentation and was not quite able to, to get this to go. But um, I'm going to give this a, a shot here and uh, we'll see what happens. All right. All right. So I'm going to stop the share on that. I'm going to open this. And then I'm going to come back to here. Share screen. Click there. OK, now, can anyone see the video? <laughs> I, I can see it paused at one second, so it's looking OK, good. very good. I'll, I'll click the go button. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. OK, this is the, the first step, cleaning the surface of the glass. What Mel just sprinkled on top of the glass is lab grade precipitated calcium carbonate, chalk, pure chalk. And he's gonna, in a moment, he's gonna spray a little bit of distilled water to make a, a thin slurry. And then with a few cotton balls wadded together, he's then going to scrub the surface of the mirror. There you go, there are the cotton balls. Now he's getting a sprayer that's full of distilled water. And you can see how thin the glass is there. That's yeah, really remarkably thin and just little, little, little spritz of distilled water. Now this, uh, this, this event attracted a small crowd of people wanting to, uh, to see how spray silvering works. So during this whole process, Mel and I were talking not only to each other, because this was the first time he had done it, and I was helping walk him through the process. Yeah, there we go. So, so you can see now he's just going to scrub along. He's putting, oh, maybe a, you know, a kilo of pressure on the, on the mirror surface. There's no danger of scratching the glass with the lab-grade precipitated calcium carbonate, because it, it is so much softer than the glass is that it just, it's just something that you don't have to worry about. So, so this process goes on and on. He, he'll, he'll scrub the entire optical surface, and then he'll scrub the very outside, um, um, the sides of the, of the mirror as well, because capillary action can pull contaminants from the side of the glass up onto the optical surface, and then the coating gets ruined there on the, um, 
on that surface there. So let's see. Okay, we'll stop that share. Now there's a second video. So once, once the, the glass is clean, and there's, there's a, a good deal to determining when the glass is clean, but the surest thing is when the, the, the glass starts to squeak, you know, audibly squeak, when you're, when you're getting at the end of cleaning it with the calcium carbonate and rinsing it off and also still using fresh cotton balls to do that. So then let's see, let's go back to share screen, share this one. Okay. Okay, now in that hand spray bottle, Mel is spraying on what's called a sensitizer. It's basically stannous fluoride. And what this chemical does is that it helps the silver chemicals, the, the silvering chemicals adhere to the glass surface. So he just sprayed that on the mirror, very straightforward. Then you, he, you let it sit for 30 seconds. He rinsed it thoroughly with more distilled water. And then it was on to actually putting the silver coating, spraying the silver coating on the mirror itself. And that's what this next video will show. This is a very short, short video because let me get it going here. All right. Okay, by the by the time I got my my camera rolling on the action here, the silver had already developed on the glass. Um, so that was like maybe 10 seconds from bare glass to bright, shiny silver coating. And uh, that was by far the fastest I've seen a, a silver coating develop. And I think we think it's because of the, of the very low humidity where, where Mel lives. Um, and it just took basically that long, about 20 seconds, and then boom, here's this beautiful silver coating that, uh, all right, so, all right. Okay, so that's all the screen. Now let me, let me go back to my uh, presentation here. Here we go. Let me just flip all the way back. Okay, oops. All right, so, so that's what I have today. Um, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments, and again, those videos along with several others are in the complete instructions at this website. So if, if you want more, all the information, and there, there's a lot there, plus there's a separate document that describes how to measure reflectivity using a DSLR camera. Um, it's a, a brilliant method that has shown, been shown to be within one to 2% accurate compared to professional uh, equipment. And you can do it at home, like I said, just with your regular DSLR camera. Um, and also there's a, a third document there that describes some, some life testing, some accelerated life testing that was done to see just how strong the silver coating can be um, over time. So there's three documents here at this website. The first one is about the, 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 the precise instructions and how to do it. Um, don't be don't be scared off by all all the writing there. It's uh, it, it's not as difficult as all the paragraphs make it seem to to be. So, with that, we'll click that off, and there you go. Great, thank you, Howard. That was a fascinating talk.
I must admit, I hadn't really thought of um, modern silvering of mirrors until uh, you uh, you talked about uh, how how it's still being done today. Yeah, um, it's it's been it's it surprised me about five years ago that this was a process that anyone could do. Um, I, I forget precisely how I came across the information on how to do it. It's somewhere online. Um, actually, no, I do remember. It was on cloudy nights. A gentleman from New Zealand was talking about his telescopes that he had spray silvered. And I was like, what? <laughs> you can do that? <laughs> and so that got, that got the ball rolling. Um, and uh, I know he bought his chemicals from Angel Gilding. He made his own spraying equipment and he got excellent results. So yeah, it's, it, it's very interesting. I, uh, I I never I've never thought of myself as um, as someone who could deal successfully with chemicals, but in this case, it's it's so easy that even a uh, a fumble bum like me can can come up with a good result. Fantastic. Well, I see we're already starting to get in a few questions. Um, people can type in the Q and A on Zoom or in the comments on YouTube. Um, I'll just give it a minute and give a quick plug for the upcoming BAA events which we have. So on 30th of March, that's a Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., we're back at um, the Institute of Physics again. So they've got the, the building problems fixed. And we've got a talk by Jacqueline Mitten on Maria, Maria Mitchell, the Danish Comet Medal and early American astronomer, and Martin Lewis on imaging the night side of Venus. Um, just to note, although the tickets are free, you need to book in advance because places are limited. So if you go to the BA website, you can book a place because there's a link to uh, Eventbrite. Then for the weekend, starting on the 8th of April, we still have some places available on the Winchester weekend if anyone wants to go there. And please note, we don't know, we, we're not sure if we're going to be live streaming. At the moment, there's no live streaming of that. So if you want to see what's going on, um, you'll need to uh, attend in person whilst at the Institute of Physics, we're hoping to be able to live stream there. Then we have the spring meeting on 23rd of April, that's a Saturday, on stellar winds and planetary atmospheres. And on a slightly relevant topic, we have the historical section webinar on Saturday, May the 14th. So I can see we've had questions in from Darrell Dobbs and Jeremy Shears. So starting with uh, Darrell, he's interested to know uh, what happened to the Foucault telescope and is it usable or just a museum piece? I think it's a museum piece now. Um, what museum, if it's in an actual museum or is that the, on the grounds of the Marseille Observatory, I, I don't really know. But that, that color photo was a fairly recent image. Um, and it, it is an historic telescope. And, and certainly worth preserving. So I, I think if, if you did an online search, you'd be able to find exactly where it is if you're down, down in that area and want to take a look at it. And I, I was wondering as well, with, with your 30 inch, that's pretty much the same size as the, the Foucault, isn't it? It's pretty close, yeah. I mean- Just maybe, maybe an inch or- sure. <laughs> clo clo Close enough to not really matter in, yes. in terms of what you see in the eyepiece, yeah, yeah. Um, the next question is from Jeremy Shears. Well, he says that when he was a schoolboy, he silvered a telescope mirror in the chemistry labs, and it was great fun. Um, they were taught to brush the fresh silver surface using chamois leather and a tiny bit of rouge. Apparently, this was to lay down the silver more uniformly. Um, do, you, do you need to do this in your process? Have you heard of it? No. Yeah, I, I know exactly what, what Jeremy is referring to. And, and in the spray process, th that is not needed. And he's exactly right in the, um, you know, in the original process, doing that, that basically that, that burnish, it's called burnishing with the ch chammy, we call, I, I, I pronounce it chammy leather and a tiny bit of red rouge. Um, and this was to lay down the, the, the silver onto the mirror more uniformly and help it adhere better because it was basically just a bath of, of chemicals on, on the surface. The spray, the pressure from the spray basically takes the place of having to use the champ. So it's, uh, now there are 
um, instances where you might still want to use a chamois and a tiny bit of rouge because depending on the humidity and temperature um, when using the spray process, you can get a, it's called a silver burn on the very top of the silver coating, which is where the very top layer of the silver has crystallized and you need to use that chamois to brush that off. But that, that's on rare occasions, and I, I've only had the, I've only seen that happen once. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Daryl makes a comment that the, that, that mirror was remarkably thin, and whether it has lots of supports on the back. I, actually, it is, a, it's remarkably thin, you're right. It looks like a big contact lens. Um, that, was, that was my first thought when I saw it for the first time. Um, You'll be surprised to know the, the back surface, the, the back supports are only 18 points. Um, it, uh, what's going on, and then the reason why that's possible is that be, because of the strong concave shape of the glass, that geometry gives it quite a bit of stiffness on its own. So you, you th think of a bowl, you know, and how, how you, you can't really push down the edges to make it into a flat sheet very easily, but a flat sheet you can bend relatively easily if they're even when they're the same thickness. So basically just that geometry, it gives it a great deal of strength to where it doesn't need any elaborate back supports. Interesting. Now that said, I will say the edge support becomes a, a trickier, a trickier thing to, to manage. And it's, it's something that in the case of Mel's 30 inch, I don't, I haven't asked him this, but I wouldn't be surprised if he planned it from the beginning, but that when you have an edge support, you want the edge supports to be right at the center of gravity of the, of the edge of, of the side of the mirror. You don't want it too, too close to the front edge or too close to the back edge of the mirror. Well, as it turns out, the, the thickness of his mirror, the back edge of that, when you look at his mirror as a cross section, is precisely at the center of gravity. So he's able to use just a basic sling side support, and it works perfectly. Hmm. Now, if it was, you know, if the curve was a little less deep or even deeper, that wouldn't be the case. So that's why I kind of think that he did that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like he, he's a bit of calculation there to get yes, it spot yes. on. Yeah, well, he he uh, he is a recently retired programmer, so that's why I'm pretty sure he he planned it that way. Nice. Um, next, we have a few questions in from Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Shears mm -hmm. again. Um, Chris, he says, uh, well, you mentioned the need to have several specular mirrors to swap while we polishing one. Do you know how often that was necessary? Um, it depended on the, the conditions where the telescope was used. I mean, how, how damp, particularly. I mean, how, 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 how clean the, the mirror was able to be kept. Uh, but also it depended on the, the actual alloy, the, the mixture of, of metals that was used to, to make the speculum metal. So I, I've read where speculum would last anywhere from two months before it tarnished too much to a year before it tarnished too much. So that's why you know, they always had two, two mirrors, at least two mirrors. So one was in the telescope and one was being repolished, which you know, today seems like, gosh, you know, who, who would, who would want to have a telescope if that's what was required? Your reflecting telescope, everyone would have a refractor thing. And it certainly was a, 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 um, a big part, I think, of, of why refractors kept getting larger and larger and larger as well, because that just wasn't a consideration in any way at all. But um, yeah, it was, it was quite an investment in time and, and resources to, to have a specular mirror telescope back then. And next, we have a, 
An important point from Jeremy on the um, on safety during spray silvering, mm -hmm. and he's kind of asking what are the hazards, and um, he's saying that actually he was thinking that he probably wanted to wear safety specs to be worn mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to protect your eyes, and whether there might be other precautions which are advisable. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, yes, there are precautions that, that should be taken. If you're doing this process in, a, in an enclosed area, if, if you're doing it like the, the short videos we showed, the, the, the mirror was set up on the silvering jig right at, the, at an open garage door. And so there was a lot of ventilation. And so there, there was no need to wear a respirator. Now, if that door was closed, let's say it was the weather had been terrible that day and the wind was howling, then respirators would have been needed. Um, you don't necessarily need safety glasses. Um, and even though there's, you know, there, there's spraying going on, it, uh, there, there is no back spray coming back towards the person holding the sprayer. It just goes off to the sides. And so even, even if it's done in an enclosed space, you know, safety glasses are needed. Of course, they don't hurt. Um, you know, it, it, it depends basically on how, how carefully you want to be. You know, pretty much any piece of, you know, equipment you buy for your home, you know, lawnmower or a toaster, um, garden shears, they all say wear safety glasses. Well, I mean, who, who wears safety glasses uh, when you're mowing your lawn? But, you know, that's always a recommendation. And in this case, it, it really isn't needed. I guess the thing is to, to make sure you're careful and think about the precautions which you might need in your circumstances. Exactly. And, you yes. know, make sure, yeah, don't, don't look at the nozzles. Yeah. If, you do, if you do it in an enclosed area, wear a respirator because the, the, the chemicals, although they're, they're not lethal, potentially lethal, I mean, they are harmful if you breathe them in for an, a prolonged period of time. And, you know, when you're enclosed, those, those vapors are going to linger. Um, you know, you didn't see us wearing respirators in that video when the spraying was going on, but uh, because we were just basically almost outside. And then uh, Jeremy's final question was, um, do you take precautions to protect the silver surface from tarnishing? Um, he's saying we used a pad impregnated with lead acetate to chemically neutralize the sulfur compounds in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but sulfur in the atmosphere was much, was much lower these days. Any other atmospheric pollutants? Um, yes, um, there, there are. Uh, pollen is a big one. Um, bugs. I mean, it's surprising. You have a, a, a you know, bug crawling across the uh, unprotected silver coating. You, you, you'll see the effects. Um, also, if you have your silver mirror stored inside your home in the living area, it'll tarnish much faster just because human beings have exhalations that, that includes sulfur um, that accelerate the tarnishing process. You, the, um, you can buy, um, it's called um, anti-tarnish cloth on Amazon. And it's basically just cotton cloth that has been impregnated, I guess, with lead acetate that you just drape over the, the mirror when you're not using the telescope. And that neutralizes sulfur compounds it keeps all the other atmospheric contaminants from collecting onto the mirror and it helps it last a lot longer. There, there's also another thing that I didn't cover in my presentation. There is a, a liquid called Midas anti-tarnish. And this is a, a compound developed for the uh, electronics industry to keep silver in, in electrical connections from tarnishing. And at the end of the silvering process, you pour this liquid over the top of the silver and it will, it slows down, it greatly slows down the tarnishing process quite considerably. Um, 
It doesn't stop any other atmospheric contaminants. I mean, if a bug walks across it or, or a pollen gets on there, then it'll still start to degrade the, the silver. But it does slow down the tarnishing quite a bit. Ooh, interesting. At the moment, no more I think, questions. I think that's I'll, it. I'll make a comment, <laughs> having recovered slightly from the tooth operation. Oh. Yeah. That, that, that was a really interesting, um, really interesting talk, Howard. I've never heard anybody talk about that before, this subject before. I can tell you why the, the Great Melbourne Telescope was built with a specular metal mirror. It was because Sir Howard Grubb, the leading British telescope maker of that period was dead against the silvering idea. Uh, he continued to maintain, even into the 1870s, that uh, the way forward was better speculum metal mirrors. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a lot of conservatism about it. And of course, he, he had been involved with the, uh, the Ross telescope and, and big, really big telescopes. So mm -hmm. he, was, he was the big authority. And there's a correspondence in the memoirs of the Royal Astronomical Society between him and Andrew Common in the 1870s. And Andrew Common, who built uh, a 36-inch telescope and a 60-inch telescope with silver on glass mirrors, was arguing that silver on glass was the way to go. And uh, Grubb was still arguing in the 1870s uh, for specular metal mirrors. And incidentally, uh, in, I found out in the research I did on Commons Telescope that he came up with a really strange method of silvering his mirrors. He actually suspended them upside down over a bath of mercury to allow the vapour to uh, silver them. And the, the mirror was held upside down with suction power. It was oh. like on, on a big suction cup, which sounds really risky. <laughs> so it does. I've never heard of that. That's, that's remarkable. But uh, how well that, uh, what, what results he got? I don't know. He probably got good results. Well, I hope it was worth all the effort, yes. But my, my telescope mirrors are aluminized, like most people's, and living in a very polluted London environment, I find they don't last very long. Mm -hmm. They only last a couple of years, really. Ah, yeah. Uh, how would you say the performance of, of the silver coating is likely to compare with, and everything else being equal with an aluminium coating? Well, the, the, the silver won't last as long um, under any circumstances, that, that, at least so far, that we know of. The aluminium is, is more durable, even in an environment like, like the one you're in. If, if an aluminum coating is, is, goes bad in two years, the silver coating would probably go bad in six months. Um, the advantage in that environment to having, being able to do a silver coating is that you can redo it yourself at home every six months and, and go, and so you'd start with a mirror that's 97% reflective. It would quickly degrade over six months to be maybe, let's say an average of, 85% reflective, then you recode it and you're back at 97%. So you're, you're never going to get to the point where an aluminum coating, if you just stuck with it, you know, which a bare aluminum coating starts at 88%. Enhanced coating, you can get 96%. Um, but, you know, then, then it's a balance of, you know, do you, do you want to mess with the process? You just want to send it off somewhere? It just is such an individual choice based on your own per personal calculations. Yeah, it was interesting the figures for reflectivity you quoted because I've heard other people say that the image with a, a silvered mirror is more red than the image with an aluminized mirror. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that seems to be reflected in your figures. Yeah, the, 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 the reflectivity in the red is, is astonishing. Um, and certainly, you know, cruising through the Milky Way, red, yellow, and orange stars pop out unbelievably well. Um, you know, a carbon star is so, such a saturated red, it's remarkable. The, 
you know, the blue channel is what goes first. That's because of tarnishing. Tarnishing takes out blue, turns, turns the silver towards yellow. Um, but the, the images, you know, to me of, of nebula, planets, galaxies, they don't have a reddish tone. Um, they just tend to have more contrast. I mean, that, that's my experience. You know, I have, a, I have a large telescope, so it may be a different thing in a smaller telescope, I can't really say. Yeah, although there is one thing I, I wanna to add to your comments about, uh, about why um, silver and glass wasn't um, adopted after Foucault's success with its 80 centimeter telescope. I, I read a remarkable um, uh, excerpt from something that Foucault himself had written about how he had been invited um, by Grubbs, by the committee that was building the Melbourne Telescope to talk about his silver on glass technology. And he came and everyone was very interested. They made him an honorary member, the Royal Society, great applause. He went home and he said, he, he, he completely ignored everything that he said. So, um, but I think you're exactly right. You know, an entrenched technology is difficult to dislodge, especially if you have a a strong and well-respected champion for the old. Yeah, and a bit, a bit of xenophobia in there most probably and, as well. Like, like the failure to adopt the metric system about the same time. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 have, I have no standing on that one, that's for sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me again. And yeah, and thanks back, very yeah. much. Alan Buckman is also thanking you in the chat for a great website with oh, yes. fantastic detail. Oh, yes, very good. Oh, and Jeremy says that he, he wears safety glasses and mowing the lawn. <laughs> so, okay, so we, you're... We have some pretty dangerous lawns over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. And that Angel Gilding says they ship to England. So there you go. Okay. Well, Thanks again, Howard. And uh, my pleasure. Yeah, hopefully we can get you back again for a talk on your uh, thirty-inch at uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, it would be a, be a pleasure again. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see many uh, people who are here, um, either at the IOP or online for the IOP. And until the next meeting. All right. Farewell. All right.